in the case of Jimmy Kemsky, Philly Voice, at Jimmy Kemsky on Twitter. It's many other issues as well that he's smarter than me, but he's kind enough to spend a couple of minutes. Kemsky, what's happening, man? Uh, I'm not very smart. Let's not go too far here. You're smarter than me, and the bar's set pretty low. So, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, for about eight minutes, I was a part of the most highly trafficked site, uh, pardon me, post on your site yesterday, and then I think you put something out with the Eagles, and then it just went back to normal, and you dwarfed it. So thank you for that. Oh, no problem. <laughs> Happy to help. Carson Wentz, will we see him again for the rest of the season? I don't know. I mean, I didn't even know he was hurt until uh, <laughs> Doug Peterson's press conference today at 1030. <laughs> and he was kind of sly about that. So normally in, in press conferences with Doug, we got to ask about five or six or seven or however many individual uh, injured players there are on the team, and it basically wastes half the press conference. And today he comes out, and I think that's the way they prefer it, really. Right. And today he comes out and he says, uh, hey, uh, how about if I just say all the injuries right off the top <laughs> of the press conference? And I was like, oh, wow, what a treat. So, Why do you think he did like, that? So he, so he names three, four guys, and he, so there it is. There's Jernigan's day-to-day. Uh, Maddox is getting better day to day. Hicks is getting better day to day. Oh, and, and a new one. Uh, Carson has uh, he's got a he's got a back issue. It's a little sore, um, and we'll see how he goes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why. I mean, they wanted to just mention that, and he tried to kind of stick it in there. Uh, you know, after he mentioned four or five guys, and he goes, uh, and, and anyone else? And somebody said Sidney Jones. Oh yeah, he's day to day too. So, <laughs> but, so like we only learned about it then. I guess he felt that he had to say something about it, but he was he didn't give us anything else really beyond that. Somebody asked him if uh, you know they expected him to play against the Rams. They didn't go as far as as, as questioning the rest of the season, uh, but he kind of danced around that question. He just said, you know, we're taking it day to day, blah blah blah. blah. Uh, and then you know, of course, after the press conference ends, um, you know, everyone's trying to you know figure out what exactly is the issue with him and Ian Rappaport tweets out that he could be done for the season so you know I don't know again like I said I I, I only learned about this injury during that press conference Mm -hmm. as everyone else did so I'm just kind of trying to figure all that out myself but uh, it certainly does kind of appear that that he may be done for the season well I was going to ask that as far as you get this news from Doug Peterson and you immediately reach out to the people you know and you trust what are you getting as far as a general feel for how serious this is, how long this has been nagging, and you kind of answer the third part of it, which is, you know, really what you, not Ian Rappaport, but what you, Jimmy Kemsky, are hearing about the longevity of this injury. Well, so to begin, he was on the injury report earlier this year with a with a back issue. Um, in week six, he was a limited participant uh, during one of the practices, and that was just because of, it said, um, I think it said non-injury related, something or something like that. And then the next two weeks, week seven, week eight, he was a limited participant again for the first practice of, of uh, both of those weeks with the back issue. So this is a situation where, um, you know, that his back has been sort of a nag. And Doug even mentioned he used the phrase nagging injury. So this isn't something that all of a sudden popped up uh, because of a hit in the Dallas game or anything like that. It's been something that he's been dealing with. Uh, it, it appears for you know the better part of the season, and uh, I guess finally has I guess um, been tweaked to the to the point where he can't go, or he probably won't be going. Uh, on he probably won't be playing on, on Sunday against the Rams. So again, I, I I don't know what this means in terms of his long term mm-hmm. health of, of his back. I really have no idea, but it just seems like it. Doug did say nagging injury. I don't know if it's if it's a long term thing or a short term thing. But uh, I do think that, you know, he does have a little bit of an injury history now. Obviously, the ACL and the LCL as being the biggest injuries. And he's got that contract extension potentially coming up this offseason. And it'll be interesting to see how, you know, these injuries and this latest back injury kind of factor into that. Do you think that there's any way around, is there any middle ground with a contract with a guy like Carson Wentz who has at least shown one year that he can play at an MVP level, and then also was dealing, as you said, the obvious, the injury history. But I feel like that position, there's very little wiggle room. That's why you had the Staffords and the Romos and the guys that just get locked in to these huge contracts, and then you have Wentz. I I just, I don't know if there's any wiggle room this offseason. It seems like the Eagles might just be in a corner 
where they have to lock him in simply because of how good he is. Yeah, if I were Wentz's rep- uh, representation, I wouldn't. I, I would be adamant that uh, we're not taking any kind of discount yep. because of some perceived uh, injury history, whether it's valid or not. Um, and from the Eagles' standpoint, I can understand why they'd be apprehensive, maybe about paying him as if he doesn't have this history of, of injury. So, yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. Jimmy Kemsky joining me, Aton Shanderin for Mike Gill. It's the Sports Bash 97.3 ESPN. So Carson Wentz, clearly, and I guess it'll come back in the conversation, aside now, you know what's going to happen here, and I'm sure that you've already seen it on Twitter. So much has shifted. I think he's, he's still the top trend in Philadelphia right now is Nick Foles, but this is clearly a different football team that Nick Foles, this is a different river that Nick Foles is stepping into than he did last year, Jimmy. Yeah, I mean, obviously the team was playing great uh, this time last year. You know, they made the trip out to L.A. uh, at at this time last year as well. And uh, he played okay in that game. And then we saw how bad he was (laughs) in in the next few games. He was actually okay against the Giants uh, the week after the Rams game. But then he was horrendous against the Raiders. And he was bad. He was really bad for the quarter or two or whatever it was uh, in that final week against the Cowboys. And then obviously he kind of turned it around about midway through that first uh, playoff game against the Falcons. So he's a guy that kind of has to get into a rhythm, I think, sometimes when uh, before he kind of gets going. And he doesn't have a lot of time <laughs> to kind of get that rhythm going if the Eagles are going to, you know, compete potentially for, for a wild card. They're only a half game back uh, in, the, in the wild card hunt. But obviously they have a, a very difficult schedule playing at the Rams. And then they have the Texans at home. And then, you know, the last game is, is obviously a, a pretty easy one with the Redskins on their fourth quarterback so far. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's, um, it, you know, he's stepping into a situation where he's going to have to win at least, you know, one of those two really difficult games. And, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. I mean, the, I know the Rams game, the, uh, the line was, what, nine? Yeah. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see how much of that jumps up with this latest news. Well, that feeds into where I was going to go. What do you think is more likely to happen, Jimmy? The Eagles beat the Rams or they lose by more than 30? (laughs) Oh, man. Uh... Now, remember, the defense played basically every single snap that was available last week against the Cowboys. lose by more than 30. I think it's more likely they have maybe not necessarily as bad a performance as they had against the Saints. Right. But uh, I don't give them much of a chance at all winning this game. So last year was such an anomaly because obviously, or I I shouldn't say obviously, it it wasn't at all for anybody that Nick Foles was going to be able to step in and and do what he did. But still, the expectations were, all right, you've made the playoffs. Let's just see what happens. Now we know that for all intents and purposes, this team, this season is shot right now. What do we gain? What do we learn? What can we do as far as take anything positive, extract anything from the final three weeks of the season, especially with the assumption that Wentz won't even be out there. Uh, maybe they got a higher draft pick. <laughs> so, so we root for 0-3. <laughs> Is that what yeah. you're saying? If you're looking for a silver lining, that's about all I got. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, No, 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 not even a silver lining, I guess. Uh, I mean, how much are we looking at guys playing for their jobs? How much are we looking at guys maybe for the last time in an Eagles uniform? Things maybe along that where it's not so much – playing for draft position, but any storyline that makes this team somewhat relevant? Yeah, if you're looking at a player you know, of note, maybe playing his last few games with the Eagles, would be Brandon Graham, maybe? Yeah, well, maybe. That's twice you said that. It may, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, his situation has uh, kind of not developed <laughs> over the last year or so. People thought he might be getting a contract extension. Nothing's happened there. So I think what will happen there is he'll hit the open market. And then if, uh, you know, the market doesn't really develop for him, then he can come back uh, to Philadelphia. But if he gets some huge deal somewhere else, you know, or somebody gets some huge offer from somewhere else, I don't know how much the Eagles will be able to, you know, match that. But So that would be one guy maybe playing in his last game. We'll see. Uh, as far as other storylines on the for the players well, on this team. Let, let me ask I, you this. I don't know. I mean, there, there aren't really they, – they, it's not a very young team. Right. So there aren't. Maybe like Dallas Goddard, maybe you see him involved more. Um, I'm I'm stretching. (laughs) No, 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 that's fine. I'll give you an easy one. I'll give you a much easier one here. I know that it might not all be Mike Groh's fault, but we've seen this, and especially with this team, 
time and time again where a guy who's higher up on the chain says, well, it ain't going to be me that falls on the sword, so somebody else has to. It's hard for me to think that Mike Rowe returns as the offensive coordinator. Agree or disagree? I... Oh man, I'd go fifty fifty on that, not to you know. Can you give me like fifty one forty nine? I won't hold you to it. It's not like we're going to tweet go, this out and quote tweet you, okay? If if I have to go fifty one, I'd say fifty one. He's gone. Okay. What what's the difference in that one percent for you? It just hasn't been good. <laughs> I mean, the offense really just. Hasn't well, what been good. what keeps him? Let's more, think about more, that. More damning. More damning is that it hasn't been good. Um, you know, early in games, in the first quarter in particular, they've been dreadful on offense. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously a lot of that goes, I think you can, I think, you know, lo- logically you can kind of point to uh, game preparation for that first quarter. And it just hasn't been there this year like it was a year ago. Do you think that it's just a matter of putting somebody different around Doug Peterson because the conversation surrounding Filippo when he gets fired? But, I, I again, it, it may not be simply Mike Gross' fault as much as it is creating a vacancy to put somebody that's a better fit around Doug? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know what the relationship is. Obviously, Doug felt the relationship was good enough to promote him from you know wide receiver coach yeah. all the way to offensive coordinator. Um, Mike Groh has had a, had a little bit of a hand in the game planning a year ago. It was mainly Doug, Frank Reich, and DeFilippo, and then Groh was in there a little bit as well. And I guess he felt comfortable with, um, I guess, contributions that Grow had made last year. So I don't think there's, there's, there's only there's a problem in terms of his relationship with with Grow and and how they're able to work together. I just think maybe it's the idea generation hasn't been there like it was a year ago. Jimmy, I, I love what you wrote after the game and doing this radio at least for a long time. It's very rare that I would lead a show with the officials. It's very rare. And there have been times in which you point to a game and say, come on, you know, the refs missed a a big one, but you look at a bunch of different factors. And this was a Monday morning, five 45. I'm on at Fox. And that's the first thing, you know, we talk about. And you, I I think it's, it comes off. I don't want it to come off cliche because this happens a lot where somebody says, Hey, you know, the Eagles got screwed. But you took yeah. it above and beyond, and I commend you for it because you even put a tweet out, and I'm paraphrasing you, like, listen, I'm going to be annoying to even the people that love me to the point <laughs> right. in which I'm just going to insist. So what what do we do? Because I've never seen a more clear-cut Exhibit A example that things are just not on the up-and-up in the NFL than that Eagles-Cowboys game. Yeah, so it wasn't just that they were bad calls. I mean, bad calls happen in every game. Like, you'll get a bad rough in the passer call. You get a, a bad you know, non-call on a hold or something like that. I mean, they, they, that just happens. But there were, like, four calls in this game that were just beyond egregious. The first, of course, being the fumble that uh, they challenged. And, you know, clearly I, I, I can't get into the, the nuts and bolts of that because I'll be talking for 15 minutes on, on what happened on that play. But, you know, everyone who has a set of eyes saw that that should have been Eagles ball, obviously. Yes. The other one was the, you know, the offensive pass interference that, that was that was called on Dallas Goddard or didn't do anything and actually took two helmet-to-helmet shots. One of them <laughs> was like play. a boxer. <laughs> right. One of them was, one of them was, was <laughs> I mean, clear as day. He launched the, the, the safety, number 25, launched into his head oh. and he hit him. And and you saw his helmet fly off at the end of that play when he went into the end zone. It's because it got jarred loose. <laughs> the hit was so obvious. Did you get any response from from anybody in the league at all? I'm I'm mean, gonna know that nothing. you know. Okay, nothing. No, no, nothing whatsoever. And then and then the third one was um, you know on the Cowboys' final drive in regulation, they threw a flag for holding on their on the Cowboys' left guard Xavier uh, Suofilo. Yeah. And okay, so again, that's another example of okay, that's maybe that's just a bad, you know, missing a hold is is, is a bad call, and they happen. But in this case, they threw the flag on them, and then they picked it up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Unbelievable! It's, it's crazy that they picked it up. He tackled him. I mean, he tackled uh, the Eagles' defensive tackle Trayvon Hester. Just li- he literally tackled him, and they picked up that flag for some reason. And then the fourth one, uh, one against the Cowboys, they called Ezekiel Elliott for. You know the lowering of the helmet call, um, and that was actually the right call. Like he absolutely lowered his helmet and right. initiated contact with right. his head. One hundred percent, the right call as as you know the way they wanted that to be officiated this season. But 
It's week 14, and it's the first time they called that on an offensive player all year. <laughs> it's the first time. So it just shows, you know, the, the, the inconsistency of, of calls that happened in that game. Like, the, the, what he what Elliott did on that play is really no different than what running backs and, and ball carriers have been doing all season. And then they just take randomly week 14 to, to finally throw a flag on that. It's just weird. So there's a lot of weird things going on in that game. Not just bad calls, but egregiously bad calls that – were either officiated wrongly or picked up or just kind of just outrageous in, in, in some kind of way. People are still retweeting the story. I love it. At Jimmy Kemsky with an I at the end on Twitter. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. And I'm sure that I'll make sure I should say down here and anywhere I run into that people keep retweeting that. because. But to be fair, the Eagles will probably need that type of help in order to beat the Rams this week. So maybe the pendulum swings back their way. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It kind of has to, I would think, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, Aton. Appreciate you it. Got it, man. Jimmy Kevsky, Philly voice.